Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I'm going to show you my set of the dark. Here we go. Of course, there are more than these four cards. I've got the whole set complete, not times four, unfortunately, but I thought it would be fun to kind of go through another collection. I've got a few more collection videos on my channel. By the way, there's an info card popping up right now with the playlist. So you can uh, you can go there after this video, perhaps if you want to see more of my, uh, my old school collection. So today I want to talk about the dark. So the dark is actually a small set. It was the fourth fourth expansion. It was released after Legends. It, it has 119 unique cards. It's got commons and uncommons in the set. Officially, there are no rares in there, but actually there are, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later. Uh, maybe it's first nice to kind of look at these four cards. So this is a play set of Blood Moon. I think Blood Moon is probably the strongest card in the set. It's a card you see quite a lot. It's an enchantment. One red and two that reads, all non-basic lands are now basic mountains. And what I like about Blood Moon is that Blood Moon still sees play in the other format. So it's not just used in old school, it's also really good in other formats. And it's it's such a great answer to, of course, the five color good stuff decks, but also just against Mishra's factories, you know, they're now just turned into mountains. It, it, it's quite nice, it does a lot of work. Um, and this is a booster wrapper of the dark. So the boosters used to contain eight cards, two of which are uncommon, six are common. Now, um, talking about that, you know, this is a, um, I'll show it here. This is a common print sheet because in the dark you have common ones and common threes. You don't have common twos. And what that means is when they printed a common sheet, the common ones only appear on the print sheet once and the common threes, the C3s, appear on the print sheet three times. For example, Waterworm was printed three times. It's a common three. And the cool thing is, or interesting thing is, there's actually only one common one in this set, which is Maze of If. So even though Maze of If is a common, strictly speaking, it is actually an uncommon. So when you open up a pack like this, it can be in the six common cards, but it's very rare, you know, as a common. It's the most rare common that there is. Talking about rares, there are no official rares in the set, but again, it's all about how often is a card printed. So when we, when we look at the uncommon print sheet, in the dark, you've got uncommon twos and uncommon ones. So simply meaning the uncommon one only appears once on a print sheet, right? And the uncommons two appear twice as often. So again, an uncommon one, actually when you look at the amount that it actually got printed, you could say it's a rare. So uncommon ones are rares and the common ones and the uncommon twos are uncommon and then the common threes are common. That's kind of how the set is built up. Now what I wanna do in this video today is just go through all the different sections, all the different colors of the dark, the artifacts and the lands with you and kind of talk about them. So join me today on this journey into the dark. Okay, let's get into it, shall we? Let's open up the binder and go to my set of the dark. Yeah, such a cool set. Um, designed by Jesper Mearforce, who really wanted to give it this, this dark Halloweenish gothic style. Um, I love it. I love what he did with the set. I think it's a, it's a fantastic set because it's recognizable. I can recognize a card from the dark. Now this set only has 119 cards in them in total, so it's a small set. And what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to go through the lands, the artifacts, the colors, uh, of course, all five of them, and the uh, the golden cards that are in the set as well, and kind of discuss the things that I notice when looking at the set. And yeah, I guess the lands is a good point uh, to start with today. And there's one land that <laughs> that we got to talk about. That's, of course, Soros Path. So Soros Path was called the worst magic card by Mark Rosewater, which resulted into many magic players and wizards to try to, you know, make Soros Path work. It was kind of this, this challenge, right? Which I think it still is. Soros Path, yeah, it's, it's a difficult card. If we look at what it does, it's, it's just so weird, right? You can tap it, exchange two of opponent's blocking creatures, this exchange may not cause an illegal block. Soros Path does two damage to you and two damage to each creature you control when it is tapped. So it's it's like a, a way to kill your own creatures. It's weird. And yes, there are ways to take advantage of this. Absolutely. Um, but it's difficult, especially with the old school card pool. It's very, very tricky. Uh, when we look at the rest of the land, so there are four lands in total. We have City of Shadows, Maze of If, Safe Haven, and Soros Path. 
then obviously Maze of If is probably the most played and the best of the bunch. Like I discussed in the introduction, it's a common one. So even though it's a common, it's very unlikely that you, um, that you, that you pull it as often as a regular common because it only appears once on the print sheet. So it's technically, an, well, technically it's a common, but it's kind of an uncommon, if you know what I mean, if you look at the print run. But um, it, it's such a good card because under the new rules, the modern magic rules, combat has really changed. It has changed into all these different phases and steps. So for example, if I attack with my Colossus of Sardia, I can use my Maze of If to untap my Colossus after damage is dealt. So I can go into combat, I can attack with the Colossus, the Colossus taps, right? And I'm gonna wait until blockers have been declared, damage is dealt, and then at the end step of combat after damage is dealt, I can use my Maze and I can take the Colossus out of combat. It untaps, it's back on my side of the board and it's dealt its damage. So it's like a win-win. So Maze of If is not just really good defensively, it may be even better offensively, right? Because you can give your uh, creatures a vigilance with Maze of If. And of course, let's say you've got an aggro deck with low to the ground creatures, right? And you've got like four two twos, and your opponent has one four four. You attack with your two twos, your opponent is gonna block one on the four four, so you're gonna lose a creature, right? Well, actually you don't, because you can use Maze of If to say, oh, that creature that you're blocking, after blockers are declared, but before damage is dealt, tap, and get my, uh, put my creature that's blocked into the Maze of If, and it doesn't take any damage, it doesn't deal any damage, but it survives, and then the next turn, you can continue with your aggro plan. So you actually see Maze of If in more and more aggro decks. It's quite an interesting uh, development. So here we see the, the lands. Now, all these lands have one thing in common. Of course, they're all from the dark, but also think about it. They do not tap for mana. How funny is that? When you look, for example, at a set like Arabian Nights, you also have special lands like Desert, like Library of Alexandria, but they also tap for mana. But these don't. There's actually only one land in the dark that can produce mana, and that is this card, City of Shadows. Beautiful card. Uh, tap, sacrifice one of your creatures, but remove it from the game instead of placing it in your graveyard. Put a counter on City of Shadows. Tap, add X colorless mana to your mana pool, where X is the number of counters on City of Shadows. I think City of Shadows is really cool. For example, if you use cards like Juxtapose to steal a creature uh, until end of turn, uh, or sorry, not until end of turn necessarily, but if you can use City of Shadows in combination with Preacher or with Juxtapose, you can steal a creature and at the moment you're about to lose it, you can simply sack it or you can sack it immediately to kind of remove that creature from the game. And especially with Preacher, it's a really cool combination, right? Because you can untap the Preacher again and steal a new creature and that way kind of indirectly kill all the creatures on the side of your opponent's board with the City of Shadow and Preacher combo. I think that's quite cool because you also get some mana in return. And this actually adds up. Before you know it, when that X is like three or something, that's a pretty powerful land. You know, you can really abuse that ability. It's also just nice to have in your deck in a response to removal, like your opponent plays a lightning bolt on your hippie and you say, you know what, in response, I'm gonna sack it to my City of Shadows and you're gonna keep a counter. Obviously it would be maybe too strong, but it would be really good if it would also just tap for a mana by itself without having to sacrifice anything, just as a starting point. But I guess, um, I guess that's not the case. So these are the lands and now I'm gonna continue with the artifacts. And now after we've talked about the lands, we're gonna talk about the artifacts. Now there are 20 artifacts in, uh, in the dark. And I think this artifact right here is probably one that sees a lot of play, Felwerstone. Felwerstone is very popular in Commander, I believe, but also in just regular old school, it's played a lot. It's two to cast. You can tap it at one mana to your mana pool. This mana may be of any color that any opponent's lands can produce. This ability is played as an interrupt. Now, this is a really good mana rock in old school. Why? Because a lot of decks play with City of Brass. Now, City of Brass, of course, is a land from Arabian Nights. You can tap it for any color, but it deals a damage to you. But when your opponent has a City of Brass, your Felwer Stone is now also a City of Brass. You can tap it for any color of mana, and it doesn't even deal damage to you. You know, that's the extra icing on the cake. So this is a really, really nice ramp in old school. And then we have, oh yeah, the Book of Rass. I gotta talk about the Book of Rass. So the Book of Rass is a way to draw cards, but the problem of Book of Rass, I guess it's a six mana to cast. It's so incredibly expensive. But I do think that the card drawing is actually quite good, right? You pay two and pay two life to draw one card, but you can do that as often as you want. You don't have to tap the Book of Rass for that. So 
in that sense, it's kind of good. Maybe a mirror universe next to it, you know, exchange your life for cards and then exchange your life of your opponent with mirror universe. I mean, it, it, it could be a way to go. And also, you know, Book of Rats with Titania Song. I mean, I, th I think it has maybe a place in some decks, but it's definitely a tough card to brew with. And then when we go here, we see the other artifacts in the set. And we have here, we have Reflecting Mirror. And Reflecting Mirror is just this unique little artifact. It's not that good. But in the novel that's written after The Dark came out, The Gathering Dark, where you can kind of read about the story of The Dark, it's a really good book. I can really recommend it, by the way. The Reflecting Mirror plays a huge role in it. It's really big. So this is four to cast, X and tap, target spell which targets you, targets a player of your choice instead. And X is twice the casting cost of target spell. Now that's a big problem, isn't it? This ability is played as an interrupt. So for me, this card, this was new, you know, cards that, that could do this. And I think they were afraid that maybe the card would be too strong. I think this card would have been a lot better if it says target spell which targets you or a permanent you control, right? That you can change the target of that because then you could deal with disenchants, you could deal with swords, you know, you could deal with a bolt on your face, you can deal with, with this card, but with a bolt on a creature, you cannot do anything. I also think that because you've got to pay the casting cost times two, it's really tough because you want to use this against a fireball that your opponent plays on you for lethal, but because you got to pay the double casting cost, that's kind of difficult. So I think with some tweaks, a reflecting mirror could have been really good. I do love the flavor and the idea of reflecting mirror. I think that's super cool. And like I said, in the gathering dark, it plays a really big role in that book. It's, it's a great novel, by the way. And then here we have another card that I like, Skull of Arm. This was probably, when I was a kid, one of my favorite cards from the dark because I just love cards that, that, that give you value you know, for a long run, not just a spell, but really an artifact or an enchantment. And that's what Skull of Arm does, right? It's three to cast for this artifact, five and tap, bring one enchantment card from your graveyard to your hand. I mean, that's pretty cool. Again, it's, it is a bit on the expensive side. And also you've got to wonder how often do you have enchantments in your graveyard? But then again, you know, for example, for me as a blue player, I play with Control Magic and it usually always gets disenchanted, countered or whatever, you know, a red elemental blast. And how cool would it be if I could just then get it back with Skull of Orm, uh, Orm and I could recast it. The thing is you just need tons and tons of mana to do all that, right? Five to use the, the skull, four to then cast the enchantment again. Um, you do see this card being played uh, every now and then in um, uh, in Enchantress's decks, obviously, because you play with a lot of enchantments in those, and with Skull you can get them back, which is kind of cool. So I like that. Um, there's, there are a few other cards in here that are maybe are worth mentioning. You've got War Barge in here, and uh, War Barge is really cool because it can give creatures Island Walk. And then you, of course, have Merfolk Assassin that we're going to see later in this binder, uh, also from the dark, so a blue card in Merfolk that says tap kill target creature with Island Walk. So War Barge together with Merfolk Assassin is a nice combo. What's also a nice combo is when you combine this with Atok, because um, on War Barge also reads, if War Barge leaves play this turn, target creature is buried. So that means if I can give a lot of um, the creatures of my opponent Island Walk with the War Barge, and then I can somehow sack the War Barge, right? I can get rid of the War Barge, I destroy all those creatures. And that's actually what you can do with Atok, right? I can give all my opponent's creatures Island Walk. It, of course, I need enough mana. You know, you got to pay three per creature. It's, it's, it's tough. But if you manage, then sack the War Barge to your Atok and you destroy all those creatures, which is pretty sweet. I mean, I kind of like that. I think it's, I think it's a, cool, a cool combination of cards. Anyway, these are the artifacts. So like I said, there are 20 in total. And now we're going to continue with white, probably the most interesting color, actually, in the dark. And now we are going to take a look at perhaps the most interesting color in the set, white. And the reason that white is so interesting in the set is because white does things that white normally doesn't do. And it happens here in the dark. Here we already see two great examples. We've got fire and brimstone, which is basically direct damage in white. Hello, what happened to guardian angel healing solve? Card likes that, like that. No, in the dark, you've got direct damage in white. Um, we did, of course, have Eye for an Eye, I guess, but this is a new layer on that. Then we also have Martyr's Cry, which lets you draw cards. It's not a great card, I admit it, but I do love the art and the fact that you've got card draw in white. It's so interesting. Now, um, 
Jesper Meerfors was asked about this, about the set in general, but also about the color white. And he actually said something very interesting about the set and where he got his inspiration from. So I'm just going to read some words from Jesper Meerfors. So here, uh, this is the start of the quote. My love of horror and my distrust of, distrust of organized religion went hand in hand to create the theme to that set. So he's talking about the dark. While it appears the set owes a lot to the Dark Ages, it also owes much to the Spanish Inquisition and American Puritanism. It was a set in which I wanted to show that white was not all kisses and flowers, that white could descend into theocracy and fascism. And of course, end quote, by the way, and of course, I mean, Jesper Meerfors has a point here that white is uh, like, in, in magic, white stands for the ruling power right? Order, justice, that kind of stuff. But what if the ruling power is corrupt? You know, what if the ruling power is bad? I mean, the ruling power is not necessarily a good thing. I mean, check your history books. So I think that's something that Jesper Meerfors wanted to show to us in the set of the dark. And that kind of shows the layers that he's put in there. And, you know, for example, we've got Preacher, which, you know, he's, he, he's preaching to his followers. And, and his preaching is making it so that he's converting people and it's literally what the card does right if i play with my creatures then my opponent plays a preacher the preacher can start preaching he can tap and then he can take over one of my creatures right again this is um, the card that works really well with city of shadows and cards like um, a diamond valley it's 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 a really nice combo piece and then there's also another card that i want to point out because it's so not white you know and that is witch hunter so witch hunter two white and two to cast for this one one, you can tap it, it does one damage to target player, and then you can pay one and tap two uh, white, and then return target creature opponent controls from play to owner's hand, and shamans on that target creature are destroyed. So this is of course some kind of unsummon. And again, you know, so this is a Tim and a time elemental in one creature with its own limitations, um, but I love that, you know, I love the fact that all of a sudden white can do this, and I also really like the art of, of Preacher, which is made by Jesper Meerforce, by the way, so also the director of this set. What I love about the art is that when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, am I looking at a witch? Am I looking at the witch hunter? Am I looking at a corrupted witch who pretends to hunt for witches, but actually just wants to get rid of a specific group of witches to gain more power? All these questions kind of go through my head. And when you read the novel, The Gathering Dark, and I know that the author of The Gathering Dark while writing the novel and preparing for the novel, uh, talked a lot with Jesper Meerfors about what the set is all about. And there's this character in that book that is actually working for the Church of Tal and that tries to kill all wizards, but she's actually a wizard. And it's kind of in the middle if she knows that or if she doesn't know that. So it's, it's, quite in it's really an interesting novel. If you have time to read it, I would definitely recommend it. Anyway... Um, this is white. Oh yeah, this card. Oh man. Tifadar's Crusade. All goblins are destroyed. Such a killer card. This card hardly sees any more play because goblins just don't see that much play in old school, but I do love the art. Very, very cool. Okay, this was white, and now we're gonna dive into a blue. Okay, and after white, we're gonna talk about blue. So blue together with white are actually the two colors with the most cards in the dark. So 19 cards in here as well. And yeah, it starts with this beautiful card, Amnesia, which is giving blue another weapon that it didn't have before this set, which is discard. I mean, as if blue doesn't have enough already, but okay, blue, three blue and three for a sorcery. Look at target player's hand. Target player discards all non-land cards in his or her hand. So basically you're kind of taking away all the spells and you can see that's exactly what's happening with this wizard, right? I mean, look at that brain. All the spells are taken out of there. And the cool thing here that the art is by Mark Poole and he's also put his name here kind of as a tattoo on the shoulder of the wizard. I think that's a really cool detail. Really nice card. Again, love the art of the, of, uh, of the card. In the set in general, there's a lot of different art styles, but still like I recognize the dark, uh, the dark art card from a mile away. Um, yeah, we've got Dance of Many, which is kind of a cool card. It's kind of the clone in the dark, right? Two blue for this enchantment. And when it comes into play, uh, choose target summon card in play, then put a token creature in play and treat it as if you've just brought an exact copy of target summon card into play. So Dance of Many is the enchantment that creates a token. Now, if the token dies, 
or dance of many, uh, you know, is destroyed, then the other card goes away. So if you destroy the token, dance of many goes away. If you destroy dance of many, the token goes away. Now there is a little trick around this because when you play dance of many, the token effect, the creation effect goes on the stack. So in response of you casting dance of many, you can play a boomerang, take dance of many back to your hand, but then you still get the effect of dance of many. So you still get a token into play, but the token is no longer linked to the dance of many. Your dance of many is back in your hand and then you can just recast it again. So it's really a nice way to try to just create a lot of tokens. Again, it's, it's, it's a very low power combo, but it's just cool when it works. So, so Boomerang Dance of Many, check it out, it, it works. And then we have, yeah, so this is what the set is known for as well. These cards that have the different mana symbols on them. So this is Drowned with the black mana symbol to regenerate it, which is very flavorful. I like that. I also like the fact that we've got Ghost Ship in the set. We see Ghost Ship, so Ghost Ship and Drowned, it's kind of like these two go hand in hand. A cool fact about Ghost Ship is that Ghost Ship itself is a common, which, I mean, I think it, it's really powerful. It's a really good flyer. I actually played in Timmy's Spellbook. And Fire Drake, which is a really bad Drake in red, which we'll see later, is actually an uncommon in the set. So that makes no sense to me when looking at the power level, at least. Anyway, let's put these two cards back because there's another card that has those other mana symbols on them here, Electric Eel. An electric eel, this is really weird, right? Because it's a blue card, but it's got a red effect on it. And you know, that is just kind of weird because blue and red, they're enemies of each other. So it's really weird to see those two cards work together because they're not allied colors. Again, that's something that the dark has throughout the set. You don't see any of the colors, for example, working together with white because white is kind of the enemy color in the dark, right? I mean, it's, it's so cool. I just love the flavor of that. Then, of course, here we have the infamous Giant Shark. If you know what Nukecon is, you know how important a Giant Shark can be for you as an old school player. Really cool. And this card works together quite well with Timmy. Yeah, I'm not going to explain the combo to you. Think about it, but they go hand in hand. And then there's just a lot of interesting cards in Merfolk Assess. And I talked about earlier with the War Barge. Then we've got Mana Vortex. This card goes together really well with Land Equilibrium. So this is an enchantment for uh, two blue and one. I just love the purple shades here in the back, by the way. Beautiful art. And it reads, each player who controls land sacrifices one land during his or, or her turn, her upkeep, I should say. If at any time there are no lands in play, Mana Vortex is destroyed. If you do not sacrifice a land when Mana Vortex is cast, Mana Vortex is countered. Now, there is some mean decks that you can make with this on Land Equilibrium. It is, oh, it's so horrible to play against. You know what, I'll put a link here in the little info card. And um, yeah, if you want to have a look at the deck, I'm playing against it, it's gross. That's all I'm gonna tell you, it's gross. And then of course, yeah, the Leviathan, I cannot, you know, have a video about the dark and not mention Leviathan. So Leviathan at the time was the biggest creature. This is even bigger than a Colossus of Sardia, right? And you can, I can relate to people making such a big creature thinking it's a 10-10, meaning if I can attack twice with this and it's not blocked, my opponent is dead, right? So they thought, ooh, this is so good just because it's a 10-10. And of course, now we know that it doesn't really matter how big a creature is because there are so many good answers, even in old school or maybe in old school. You know, think of Swords to Plows here as alone. One white instant speed. So I'm going to invest nine mana to cast a Leviathan and my opponent can get rid of it for one measly white mana. I mean, that is painful. So what the card does, because they thought, oh, a 10-10 is so strong. This was the biggest creature at the time, right? This was the big, this was the, the, the Emrakul, right? This, the, the word they gave it these days. This was the Emrakul of old school. So 10-10 Trample. Leviathan comes into play tapped and does not untap as normal during your untapped phase. Sacrifice two islands during your upkeep to untap the Leviathan. And you can only do that during your upkeep phase. So it's not like you can do that anytime, only your upkeep. So even that's limited. Leviathan may not attack unless you sacrifice two islands during your attack. So it comes to play tapped. If you want to untap it, I guess you can like use a twiddle. So you untap it with twiddle or, you know, another, there are other ways to untap your creature. Then when you attack, you're going to lose two islands to that as well. I mean, that is just super painful. I guess maybe with the land tax, you know, and you can find your islands again. But remember, 
It's also nine mana to cast. Oh, I guess you can use that Maze of Iftrick to untap the Leviathan. So again, that's going to save you two more islands to untap it again. Anyway, it's still a cool card. I love it. I love the art of the card. I guess you could combine it with Sword of the Ages or some kind of reanimator strategy. It's a really, really cool card. And remember, it's also a Trampler, which makes it quite good. And Trample in blue, by the way, that's pretty rare. You don't see that often. So again, the dark is, is, is really uh, uh, not going uh, by the rules of the color pie, right? It, 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 the abilities are just going everywhere. So let's put this one back. Yeah, Psychic Allergy, Mind Bomb, so many cool cards. Sunken City with some Flying Man, could be quite good. Yeah, this, the Water Worm is, I think, the only blue worm in the game, at least in old school. Let me know if I'm wrong, but I think it's the only blue worm. A 1-1, one, one. and Water Worm gains plus 0, plus 1 if opponent controls at least one island. Ooh, yeah, then you get a 1-2, yoo <laughs> love. I love how underpowered these creatures are. It's fantastic. I also love like the, the simplicity of the art, you know, this is, it's just a worm and murky water in the background. I love that. Very cool. Just a lot of motion in the picture as well. I mean, when I say simple, I mean simple composition. I don't mean the art is simple, just to explain the difference there. Beautiful, beautiful. Ron Spencer, yeah. Such good artists back in the day. Okay, um, I guess we talked about blue. That means we're ready to dive into black. Okay, time to dive into black in the set, the dark. So you may think, um, you know, black is probably the best color in the dark because it's dark, you know. That's actually not the case. Um, black, to be honest, is a little bit underwhelming. It does have some interesting cards that do some unique things. Um, you know, for example, Eater of the Dead has this unique ability. It's five mana for a 3-4, not making it that good. Again, love the art. But pay zero, take one creature from any graveyard and remove from the game, untap Eater of the Dead. So that's kind of this unique ability that you can remove creatures with uh, Eater of the Dead. So that, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Another card that can actually do that is uh, Grave Diggers. No, Grave Robbers, of course, not grave, grave Diggers. Again, the art, look at that, Quentin Hoover. This card is just insanely beautiful. Um, it's a 1-1. One, one. Tap, one black and tap, take one artifact from any graveyard and remove it from the game to gain two life. Pretty, pretty sweet card. It actually could be quite handy against all those robot decks that play with anime dead, right? To try to get their trike back. Then again, it's a 1-1, one, one, so it could easily get killed by that same trike. Eh, it's not ideal. Another really nice card here, I find, is the Fallen, just because of the flavor of the card. It's now a zombie, by the way. It's three black and one to cast for a 2-3. During its controller's upkeep, the Fallen... Does one damage to each opponent it has previously damaged. And it has a flavor text. Magic often masters those who cannot master it. The idea of the Fallen is that it's basically a wizard that cannot control its own mana and gets this burst of mana that it cannot control and then becomes the Fallen, right? It's consumed by its own spells and its own lust for mana. So that's, uh, that's some flavor. Basically a wizard with a burnout right here. Let's see what else, what kind of cards that are interesting to discuss. There's just so many. The, the, maybe the dark, I can just mention the amount of cards in black because they're less than blue and white. So this one has 18 cards. So that's one card less than the white and the blue. They had 19 cards, so there's only 18 cards. Um, I think a really cool card here to discuss is Season of the Witch. If you look at the art, so it looks like, it's like a landscape, right? But this is actually a skull. Again, art by Jesper Mareforce. Three black, it has a very unique ability. At the end of each player's turn, all of his or her untapped creatures that could have attacked but did not are destroyed. If you do not pay two life during your upkeep, Season of the Witch is destroyed. So this card goes really well with Royal Assassin because you're forcing your opponent to attack. And of course, Royal can kill, uh, you know, creatures that are tapped. So, I mean, it doesn't work against Sarah Angel, I guess, but it does work against all those other creatures. So it's pretty cool. Uh, talking about cards that it works with really well is Uncle Istvan. I'm a big fan of Uncle Istvan. I actually play um, an old school game of EDH with an Uncle Istvan deck. Uh, it, it's just really nice to play with him as a commander. Um, it's three black and one for this one three creature. All damage done to Uncle Istvan by creatures is reduced to zero. So again, 
a really nice combination with that season of the witch that I discussed earlier. And then we also have here a nameless race. A nameless race is actually the only card in the set that has no creature type. It's a nameless race. Makes sense, right? But it's the only creature, not just in the set, but in the game of magic, right? Because uh, uh, creatures without really a creature type these days are called shapeshifters, which is a creature type. But nameless race doesn't have one. How cool is that? Very, very sweet. Anyway, this is um, the black section of the dark, and that means we're now ready to continue with the red cards of the set. So after black, we are ready to discuss the color red in the dark, the red card. So just like black, there are only 18 red cards. So again, it's one card less than the white and the blue cards and equal to the amount of black cards. Now, the first card already is kind of iconic, right? Ball lightning. I mean, these days you call this ability haste, right? That it can attack the turn it comes into play. But this is very rare in old school. You don't have a lot of old school cards that do that. I guess Nether Shadow was the first card with that ability. So Bull Lightning, three red, so you gotta be committed to red. It's got Trample, it's a six one, and Bull Lightning may attack on the turn during which it is summoned. And Bull Lightning is buried at the end of turn during which it is summoned. So again, Bull Lightning could work together quite nice with the City of Shadows that we looked at earlier. But uh, yeah, this is really a good card. If you time this right, it's six damage. If you combine it with a card like Bloodlust, it's 10 damage. If you then put a Berserk on it, your opponent's dead. That is 20 damage. You know, that is the dream. Did I ever manage to do that? No. I did manage to deal 10 points of damage a few times, by the way, with Ball Lightning and Bloodlust. Uh, another card, the card actually that I discussed before even opening my binder, Blood Moon here, you know, has had a huge impact on, uh, on, on the decks of many players. Like if you play five color good stuff, you, you gotta have an answer to, to Blood Moon. Which, which they are there, you know, it's not impossible to overcome a Blood Moon, but it is a problem for, for a lot of those five color decks. And then here we see the other red card. So there's a little goblin theme. We've got goblin caves, goblin shrine. We've got goblin hero, digging team, goblin rock sled. Cool thing about goblin rock sled, by the way, is when it came out, um, to determine whether some, a creature was, what the creature type of a creature was, they used to look at the summon, right? Summon, here it says summon rock sled. So despite the fact it says Goblin Rock Slat, people weren't sure if it actually was a goblin. This led to a lot of confusion because if it's not considered a summoned goblin, then of course it doesn't work with Goblin King. It doesn't work with any other cards like the Goblin Caves and the Goblin Shrine. So it led to a lot of confusion. Of course it is a goblin, but remember, if you only had the information on the card, technically speaking, it is not a goblin. So why not just call it Summon Goblin Rock Slat? Or just a summon goblin. I mean, look at the other cards in the set. It's it's not consistent at all. I mean, we know that in old school. It's not that's part of the charm of old school that it's not consistent. But I mean, look at this goblin digging team, summon goblins. It's not called summon digging team. Right? It's just funny. And then yeah, a really cool goblin is the goblin wizard. Also one of the more expensive cards in the set, by the way. I haven't really talked about value. Um, but yeah, Goblin Wizard definitely is one of the more expensive cards. Two red and two to cast for a 1-1. One, one. Tap, take a Goblin from your hand and put it directly into play. Treat this Goblin as if it were just summoned. Now this is a super unique ability because it means your creatures kind of have flash as they call it these days. No creatures in old school can do that. So you can tap the Wizard and then you can play, I don't know, you can play your Goblin Hero, which is a 2-2, two, two, which is quite, quite big. For a, for a goblin, right? If you didn't have a goblin king next to it, you're, you're playing a 3-3 three, three in the turn of your opponent. And also what this can do, pay one red, target goblin gates protection from white until end of turn. So it's it's safe from swords to plowshares. You know, great, great card. The problem, of course, is that goblins are usually really cheap to cast anyway. And this card is kind of expensive to cast. You know, two red and two in a goblin deck is a huge casting cost for them. You know, what you get back. And usually your hand's empty already by the time you're able to cast your Goblin Wizard. But still, I love what the card does. I really like the art. And yeah, it's just, um, again, it's one of those cards with a unique ability. Talking about cards with a unique ability, Mana Clash. So Mana Clash was almost the name of magic, right? There were a few names for the game that were thought of and Mana Clash got very, very far into that naming process, apparently, if you, if you read the sources online. So the game was almost called Mana Clash. One of the cool things about Mana Clash is that in theory, 
you can win the game on turn one with the Mana Clash. Because what it does, you and target player each flip a coin. Mana Clash, the, Mana Clash does one damage to any player whose coin comes up tails. Repeat this process until both players' coins come up heads at the same time. Right? So it only stops when both players don't take damage. Mana Clash. So in theory, again, it's theory, but you can win the game on turn one with the Mana Clash. Very, very sweet. And then, of course, we have that Fire Drake that I talked about. Here we go. Yeah, so this is an uncommon. So remember, Ghost Ship is a common 2 for a flyer with regeneration, but this is an uncommon. 2 red and 1 for, for a flyer, 1 2 flyer. For 1 red, you can give it plus 1 plus 0. Oh, so I can make it a 2 2 if I invest a red, but I cannot use more than one of those reds on, uh, on my turn. And that, that is really a letdown. If at least it had a normal fire breathing effect and I could use the red as often as I want it, but I can't even do that. I mean, it, if that would have been the case, you know, if it would, would have been limitless, for example, Dragon Whelp, I can use three. If I use more, it destroys itself at the end of turn. If this creature would have the same or maybe slightly better, where it would say you can just use the red mana as often as possible, just like a regular fire breathing effect, that would make the card a little bit more interesting. But yeah, this way, uh, I'm not so sure. Fish, another interesting card. They're just a lot of like cool little cards. Maybe another nice thing to note is that you have a Sister of the Flame in the set, right? Always reminds me of a, a queen cover. <laughs> I think the art, it's almost like it's a photograph, right? And you also have a Brothers of Fire. So you got a Sister of the Flame and a Brothers of Fire. How cool is that? I mean, you, you gotta love the dark, right? You gotta love the dark. Anyway, uh, this is the color red. Now let's continue with the last color, green. And now we're going to continue with the color green. And, and it starts with the biggest creature in green. Well, when you look at power toughness, you add those up. Carnivorous planned a four five. And actually, it's a wall. Again, just like Goblin Rock Sled, it confused a lot of players at the time because it doesn't have wall in its name. So this was, I believe, the first wall that didn't have wall in its name that was actually a wall. Can you still follow me? It does say summon wall. So that kind of makes it makes it pretty clear to me. Right next to it, kind of an interesting card. Art-wise, definitely a beautiful card, but again, one of those cards that works together with an enemy color. Elves of the Deep Shadow, you can tap it to produce one black. And if we look here, these two colors are enemies of each other. So again, something that happens in the dark, you know, this, this is not producing white. Also then the art wouldn't make any sense. No, it's like an evil elf, you know, an elf of the Deep Shadow, it produces black. I like that. There's a lot of cool cards here. We've got Gaia's Touch, which, which I think is an interesting card. Oh, let me try to take it out without ruining my own binder. So Gaia's Touch, two green for this enchantment. And yet you may put one additional land into play during each of your turns, but that land must be a basic forest. And then you can also sack the touch to add two green. Again, a card that I like to play with when I have a Fujuran Enchantress deck. It's pretty cool. Goes together quite well with Skull of Arm because you, you, know, you can sack it. Goes to the graveyard, you get two green mana. You, maybe you can use part of that mana to get the Gaius Touch back into your hand. And remember, when you've got then an Enchantress deck, it means you get to draw a card every time you cast your Gaius Touch. That's kind of nice. Again, it's, it's, it's not perfect because it's costing so much mana, but once you have control, it, it's kind of a little card drawing loop, I guess. Um, then we've got Hidden Path. All green creatures gain Forest Walk, which is funny because if you play against someone who plays with green themselves, all their creatures also gain forest walk and they can attack you. So it's not that great, but if you can find a way to create green mana on the side of your opponent, for example, with the Gaius Leech, then it could be a useful card. Then we've got Marsh Viper, which is pretty cool because Marsh Viper does something pretty unique. If Marsh Viper damages an opponent, opponent gets two poison counters. If opponent ever has 10 or more poison counters, they lose the game. So the cool thing is this is kind of like how Toxic works now, right? There's this new set with Toxic. This card would then have Toxic 2, I guess, because it also deals damage and it puts poison counters on there. Before Marsh Viper came out, there was only one other creature that could put poison counters on the opponent. And that was a card named Pit Scorpion from Legends. It's a card in black. This card is a lot better in my opinion. People of the Woods Love the Art by Drew Tucker. Lurker, kind of this, this weird card with Hexproof. 
And then here we go. We have some interesting cards here as well. Again, we see Wormwood Tree Folk doing what Elves of the Deep Shadow does as well, as well. So a card that has an ability with an enemy color, which was just unheard of until the Dark came out, right? And this card is actually pretty good. We had a The Dark only tournament and Wormwood Tree Folk was in a lot of decks. It was really good. Two green and three for four, four. That also has evasion, right? Two green gains forest walk, two black green gains swamp walk. That is good. And look at that art, by the way. So goofy. It's like this evil tree trunk, right? Yeah, tree folk, this evil tree with the red eyes glaring at you. Wow. Then we've got the, oh yeah, the whopper, the whipper will, the whipper will. It's a one, one for one. Until end of turn, target creature may not regenerate for two uh, green. So people have this discussion, why doesn't it have flying? I get it, you see the, the wings and some of the cards in, um, in Old School Magic tend to have that. Also Frozen Shades, one of those cards where I think, why doesn't it fly? It looks like it's flying. Um, but when you look at what a Whippoorwill actually is, so it is an existing bird and it does tend to stay very low to the ground. It also lives very low to the ground. It doesn't have its nest in a tree, I believe. It's got its nest uh, in like the bushes. So it doesn't fly very high. So it kind of makes sense in that way that it doesn't have flying. Still, it's confusing because you see, you know, when you look at the image, you kind of want to have an idea about what the creature does. And when you look at this image, you see a bird and you're like, why doesn't it fly? So I understand the confusion. And then we've got, yeah, Scavenger Fog. That's pretty well known. It's a card that actually sees a lot of play in old school. Because it's any creature and you can pump it with Pendlehaven and it can also destroy an artifact. And destroying an artifact means it's quite strong. Remember, you're playing in a format with Moxon, you're playing in a format with Mistress Factory. So Scavenger Folk can be, can be quite good in there. Again, I love the art. I've mentioned this a few times, but now that we're looking at it, I'm just going to mention it again. This is not the hand of the Scavenger Folk. Such a cool piece of art. Another card I like here is, yeah, I like so many cards. Like, look, Tracker Unique, you know, the fight mechanic. Uh, Scarwood, Scarwood Bandits is a card I actually wanted to discuss because this card is Forest Walk, but also it can take over, take control of artifacts of your opponent. Um, it, it, you know, it's pretty cool if you use this card. And you may think, okay, your opponent can pay two to cancel the effect, and you've got to pay three to do it. So, okay, you're, you're down one mana, right? But trust me, if you keep doing this on the end step of your opponent, try to steal some artifact, at a certain point it gets annoying and your opponent's gonna say, whatever, just take it. You know, trust me, it's, 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 it can be really annoying, especially when you're playing green, you usually have enough mana anyway. So this card, again, when you play with it, you realize it's better than you may think. Okay, so now we've talked about green. We're almost there, we're almost at the end of the set, the dark. There are just three cards that we're going to discuss, and we're going to discuss that in the next chapter when we talk about the golden cards. Okay, we're almost at the end of this The Dark video. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, there are just three cards that are worth discussing here. Those are the multicolored cards, the golden cards, and there is just something strange happening with these cards. First off, we've got Dark Heart of the Wood, which is the first golden card that actually allies with an enemy color, right? Again, it's, it's those color combinations that before the dark didn't happen. You know, these are the first enemy colored combination cards, right? So this is the first enchantment golden card. You may sacrifice a forest to gain three life, counts as both a black card and a green card, dark heart of the wood. This is pretty good with Lantex. Yeah, just a little tip, it's pretty good. And then combine it with Sylvan because you're gonna gain life. You can use that life to draw cards. It's, uh, it's pretty sweet. Anyway, we also have two other golden cards and they're both goblins, which, it's just funny, you know? I wonder how that went in the process of making, uh, of making this set. It's like, oh yeah, we also want to make um, some goblins gar cards, golden cards. Why? Why do they want to do that? I do love the flavor, but then for example, why not make one goblin and one elf? You know, for example. Or, I mean, one, one blue card, one, one water worm that's also partly in green. I don't know. Anyways, Scarwood Goblins and Marsh Goblins. The cool thing is these are the first creatures that are golden cards, but are not legendary. Think about it. In Legends, all the golden card creatures are also legendary. These two are not. So again, it's an exception, right? They did something that they didn't do before. And I think that's what I love the most about these older sets. And also looking at the dark, every set that came out did something that the set prior to that didn't do. 
and it didn't feel forced. Like I feel like in today's magic sets, it kind of feel forced that they want to come up with a new mechanic or whatever. But here it was really part of the soul of the set and it kind of just happened. You know, the game was moving forward, maybe slow, but it was moving forward. So really, really interesting. Anyway, this is my set of the dark. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments below how you feel about the dark. What is, for example, your favorite card of the dark? What's your favorite art of the dark? All that stuff. Let me know in the comments. And if you'd like to see more collection videos, please let me know that in the comments as well. These videos, they take a little bit of a different approach for me to make them for you guys. I do enjoy showing you my collection, but you know, it's something else. It's stepping out of my comfort zone a little bit, I guess. So if you appreciate it, if you like these videos, let me know in the comments and uh, yeah, you know, maybe then I'll make more of them. Anyway, for now, thank you very much for watching. Before you go, please hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. Please do that if you're not a sub yet. If you're already a sub, thank you so much. Please uh, leave a like, leave a comment and share it. Ooh, I'm so good with the gestures and share it on your socials. All that is free and really help the channel move forward. And then there's one other thing that you can do and that is become a patron of the show via patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. So that is patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. You can already support the show starting with just $1 a month. And you've got my eternal gratitude if you choose to do so. For now, thank you very much for watching and let's go to the end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor?